understand the Melchizedek, divine priesthood of Christ, given unto us by God through a more superior covenant than the old order of Aaron. There are many who do not understand the new laws spoken by the mouth of Christ given to us by his father under the new covenant. Hebrews 7 verse 11 Therefore, if perfection was indeed possible through the Levitical priesthood, for the law that the people had received was based on it. This, this is the Mosaic covenant given at Mount Sinai. What further need was there for another priest, which is Christ, to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be named after the order of Aaron. For since the priesthood has changed, it is obligatory that a change of the priestly law also take place. And this is a very important fact that people need to realize. A new priesthood under a new covenant with new laws spoken from the mouth of God because that which he declares is righteousness. Verse 13 of Hebrews 7. Because the one Christ of whom these things are said belongs to another tribe from which no one was appointed to serve at the altar. For it is quite evident that our Lord has descended from Judah. Now Judah was the father of the royal tribe. And the sons of God are brought into this order. This was declared in Genesis 49. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet. For it is quite evident that our Lord Yeshua has descended from Judah. This is sonship, kingship royalty of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood because there is the dividing of the priesthood the old order have passed away God has introduced a new order through his son with new laws and a new covenant and it is even more evident because a different priest arises according to the order of Melchizedek, who was not invested according to the priestly law of a fleshly commandment, which was outward restraint written on tablets of stone, but by the power of an indestructible life, which is the mean to use the ministry of the Spirit, which comes which conforms us to his likeness and image. For he, Christ, testifies, you are he, the Father, testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For there is indeed an annulment of the earlier commandment. So the old covenant with its regulations and ordinances have been annulled, done away with, for there is indeed an annulment of the early commandment delivered to Aaron because of its weakness and unprofitableness. And this coincides and agrees with Romans 8 verse 2 and 3. What the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened through the sinful nature because the laws of Moses written on tablets of stone did not remove the problem of the sin issue in man. It did not remove the sinful nature, but the power of the ministry of the Spirit through the order of Melchizedek under the priesthood of Christ does exactly that. And we're going to understand this through this powerful teaching and revelation. Because the Father said to me, Yahweh, Elohim, a very 
fearful thing. Those who mix the two covenants. He showed me a serpent with two heads. Those who mix the two covenants are committing spiritual suicide. Because the moment we go back to the old order and we seek to be justified by it, we commit spiritual suicide and we crucify Christ all over again. It's a very serious matter. This is what Hebrews 6 is about. Go and read it. We are justified by faith in Christ and we conform to His image and likeness. We become like the lawgiver Himself, the very Word of God, Yeshua Jesus. The ministry of transformation from glory to glory into His image and likeness, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 18, I read it again. For there is indeed an annulment of the earlier commandment delivered to Aaron because of its weakness and unprofitableness. That's why the Father showed me, allowed Moses to throw the, the stone tablets, to break it, to throw them down. Because the stony heart, stubborn, stiff-necked people, the Lord did not work, could not change us. What the Lord was powerless to do and it was weakened by the flesh. Romans 8 verse 2 and 3. God did by His Son through the ministry of the new covenant. Verse 19 of Hebrews 7. Because the priestly law brought nothing to perfection under Aaron, the old covenant. It brought nothing to perfection. Rather, perfection is brought about by a superior hope. The glory of the new covenant, 2 Corinthians 3, is accelerating in glory through which we draw near to God. According to this superior measure, it was not without the swearing of an oath that he was made a priest. For those who descend from Aaron are made priests without the swearing of an oath. But he was made a priest with the swearing of an oath by him, who says concerning him, the Lord swore and will not revoke his word, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By such a greater measure than Jesus was made the guarantor of a superior covenant. By such a great measure then, Jesus was made the guarantor of a superior covenant. Now in the context of these facts we need to listen to his new laws new laws under a new covenant new priesthood and commandments spoken unto us through the sermon on the mount none of these can be found anywhere in the old covenant because there are new covenant laws spoken through a new and more superior priesthood it must be noted that he called those who desire to be discipled by him not just saved by him. Because many camp on the level of salvation as nominal Christians and they carry on living for themselves in the flesh and they stay spiritual babies. And Father showed me this through a divine encounter, through the prophetic revelatory seer anointing on my life when God caught me up in a spiritual encounter and he showed me I was in paradise, the kingdom of heaven, and I looked up, I saw the kingdom of God, Mount Zion. Garment of salvation, outer court, babies, robe of righteousness, robed in the righteousness of Christ through the discipline of the Father, through the order of Melchizedek, in the pathway up, those who pursue him into his mountain. And that pathway into Mount Zion, to the discipline of the Father, is clearly portrayed, illustrated and revealed and declared through Hebrews chapter 12. Please go and read it. It's not the righteousness of God that's imparted to us through the propitiation work afforded unto us by the blood and the finished work of the cross unto salvation. Because then we are, still, we are still spiritual babies. Then God the Father calls us into that mountain, Psalm 24, who may ascend into the mountain of Yahweh? Who may stand in the tabernacle of the Holy One? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Because it's a ruling kingdom. We are called to overcome. And then we are placed in the throne of David with Christ as mature functioning heirs and kings and priests. 
you'll understand this more clearly as we progress in this teaching. So, it's new laws through a new covenant under a new priesthood in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, will well, how will you be brought into the order of the priestly ministry of Christ as a reigning king and serving priest unless you allow him to dethrone everything in you that causes you to live in rebellion against him? Like Yeshua, Jesus declared to me, a king can only reign over that which he has fully conquered. Matthew 5, verse 1, But seeing the multitudes... Now listen, he drew his disciples towards him. Because most are just nominal spiritual babies. They camp on a level of salvation. They are church clones and bench warmers. They are spectators of the kingdom. They never submit themselves to be discipled by Christ. To be raised up into sonship. Answering the upward call of God in Christ through a laid down life. Because the expected outcome of the majority of churches only produces spiritual babies. They make salvation, the gift of salvation, the Alpha and Omega of the gospel. And that's a great deception. Because salvation is only the beginning. So we can't camp in the outer court. I saw that when I was in heaven, in the outer court, in the realm of paradise, the kingdom of heaven. And the Father took me into that mountain of Yahweh where he speaks to us in Isaiah 57. This is what the high and the lofty one says. You inhabit eternity. I live and dwell in the high and the holy place. But also with him that is of a broken spirit and a humble heart. And most live in rebellion. They saved, but they live in rebellion against the order of Christ given to us in John chapter 15 that we are commanded to lay ourselves down for his sake to become disciples so they become unfruitful in, live in ignorance of the way and the life of Christ this is very serious stuff so they forfeit sonship they forfeit the glory of the crown of their overcomer they saved the gain to heaven but they forfeit the glory and the crown of the overcomer. Because we overcome not just by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We did not love our lives unto death. That is laying ourselves down in the way of the cross in obedience to Christ as his disciples. To be brought into his order, his way of doing things. Sons who are led by his spirit according to heaven's agenda. His disciples, he's calling for those who want to be discipled by him into this Melchizedek priesthood. You raise and train as a priest and then you go into the kingship, the lion ministry. But seeing the multitudes, Matthew 5, he went up into the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, Now notice that, but seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Those who want to be disciplined in the order of Christ. You see this in Hebrews 12. While we on the go discipline, it's painful. But later on, it produces the peaceful fruits of righteousness. This born-again seed must be cultivated into the life of Christ glorified fruitfulness the fruit speaks of the mature stage of the developing born again seed we are called to sow our lives into the purposes of the kingdom to, to be raised up into the Melchizedek priesthood so his disciples responded, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, his disciples saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of heaven. Now poverty of spirit is when you are being stripped by God in the way of the cross, and you realize without God you are nothing. And it produces in you the fruits of meekness, humility. It's a fruit. It's a mature stage of the seed that's been sown through the death of self. We abandon ourselves to Christ. And in that, 
His divine nature of humility is formed in us. A fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of sonship, the fruits of the Spirit, which is the glorified life of manifested sonship, Christ-likeness, wrought out in the life and the developing stages of the born-again seed. So we are a born-again seed on our way to fruitfulness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What they're actually saying is, blessed are those who allow themselves to be entirely stripped by God. The Lord said to me, my kingdom doesn't belong to those who are self-sufficient, but to those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is to do with laying down your life in the way of the cross and through true repentance unto the death of Self, the old order of the sinful man that lives in rebellion against God, that just wants to have his own way all the time. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. These are the sons. Meekness is a fruit of the Spirit, which speaks of the maturity and fruitfulness of the born-again baby seed. So he was speaking of the blessedness of those who become mature sons of God, which declares the glory and the power of his Melchizedek priesthood of reigning kings and serving priests. This is the context of the Sermon on the Mount. The kingdom order unveiled to the teachings of Christ, the new high priest and the new covenant with new laws. That which God speaks from his lips becomes a law. That's the context of the Melchizedek priesthood. After we have been born again, saved, after, sorry, excuse me, after we have been born again and saved into the order of salvation as a baby seed of the word, we need to understand that the power and the ministry of the Spirit under the new covenant has the full potential to bring us into the measure of the full stature of the Word of God, which is Christ. 1 Peter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which lives and stays forever. We cannot stay in the unregenerated state of the born-again seed, beloved. We are called into the freedom of the overcomer, which is the fruitfulness of Christ-likeness. We are called to grow up in Him. We are called to allow ourselves to be perfected by God. Ephesians 4, verse 13 Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, that's maturity, it's fruitfulness, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we from now on be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things which is the head, even Christ. It's the upward call of God in Christ through a lay down life. We lay down our lives to take up the life of Christ, to grow up in him. And this constitutes discipline and correction and transformation and healing, and deliverance, and transformation, and conformity to his image and likeness. It's like a silkworm that goes through a feeding season into a cocoon of metamorphosis, where he becomes a new creation, and is released as a new butterfly on the high winds, and the freedom of the Holy Spirit of Resurrection. 
He called us to become serving priests under His divine priesthood. Not babies or developing children, but mature serving priests. 1 Peter 2 verse 1. Why laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies, all evil speakings, as newborn babes, the born again seed, Desire the sincere milk of the word or the water of the word. The seed must be brought into relationship with the water to activate the growth potential. That you may grow thereby. If so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious and good. To whom coming to as a living stone. Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Spiritual sacrifices. This is in context with Romans 12. Present yourself a living sacrifice. Come lay yourself down to serve as a priest, then he will bring you into the order of a king. You can't sidestep the process. There are no quick solutions to this. You can't accelerate the growth process of a seed or a child. We go through seasons, like he says in Psalm 1, we're like trees planted by rivers of water that brings forth fruit in season. The Lord said to me, learn to flow with me through the different seasons. Don't seek fruit and maturity out of season. Be patient with yourself, as God is patient with you. Verse 6, Why also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion the chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believes on him shall not be confounded. To you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but to them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the capstone, or the head of the corner, and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, which people become offended with the order of Christ, because he destroys every false foundation in us. And we want to go our own way. God says, no, I'm a stone that causes you to stumble. Turn around and repent and follow me. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense because God's order requires change, conformity to his truth. And the flesh doesn't like this. The flesh hates the ways of God and the spirit. The flesh is an enmity with God. That's why most don't want to lay themselves down because they don't want to lose control. They, they like to stay in control of their lives. He's calling for those who want to be his disciples to be disciplined and discipled by him. Not for those who camp on the level of salvation. Unfruitful Christianity. Babies, but I just live for myself and it's all about me. Let my kingdom come and my will be done. But no, the Lord's prayer, his will. We lay our wills down, we submit ourselves to the will of God. To be brought into that order of sonship. His kingdom. God has not put rebels in a place of authority. Like he says in James 4, submit yourselves to God first, then resist the devil. If you're in rebellion against God, you're going to try to resist the devil, he will rebuke you. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We are called to this. It's not cliches. Yeah, the Bible says I'm a royal priesthood, so now I'm just laying claim to it and a religious thing, but I live in ignorance. I don't even have a clue what the scripture actually says about it. No, the scripture is the substance of the clay. It's the substance of the truth that God, the potter, wants to work into the vessel to become that which you see in the word. That's the ministry of transformation of 2 Corinthians 3. Then we are brought from glory to glory into ever-increasing glory. 
and all will reflect the nature and the likeness of the Word Himself, Christ. Fruitful sons and daughters, not babies. So we are called to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy, na- a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We are called out of the darkness of our own ways to be exposed in His light and presence. God is light in Him. There is no darkness at all. If we have claimed to have fellowship with Him, we walk in the darkness where lies and the truth is not in us. But if we walk in the light, transparency and complete exposure with Him, we have fellowship with one another. That's oneness and intimacy that He prayed for in John 17, that we might, might, might be made one. Verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So I engaged in a war. He says in Ephesians 6, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness and the spiritual wickedness in my place as a prince of the power of the who is at work in the sons of disobedience. Until the Spirit of God has fully crucified the sinner in us, which is the old man who are driven and corrupted by fleshly lustful desires, shall we find that we are at war. And the only way by which the old man can be conquered and overcome is when we follow Christ in the way of the cross. We are called to arm ourselves, be weapon ourselves through the ministry and the Holy Spirit administration of the cross, not just unto the salvation of a born again seed. Because if we camp on the level of salvation as spiritual babies, we forfeit the victor's crown of the overcomer. And self is the greatest enemy and obstacle to overcome. And that is as we are stripped in the way of the cross. To lay ourselves down in obedience to Christ. So we're called to be weapon ourselves, to arm ourselves. First Peter 4. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. This is the way of the cross. Arm yourselves. Arm yourselves likewise. Because this is Colossians 2. Through the cross he disarmed the principalities and powers. Because God strips you of self. The throne of Satan in the life of man. Because Satan rules man through self-desire. My way or the highway. The principle of Satan in sinful man is self-exaltation. The way of Christ is self-abasement and the way of the cross. We lay ourselves down, we humble ourselves in obedience unto the point of death, a death that God works into us. But you must be willing, because you can resist it. It's not being saved by works, it's being brought into sonship through obedient works, because faith without works is dead. It's that which the Spirit works into us. Like the Lord said to me, Peter, the difference is you allowed me to, because we have a rebellious will by choice. We make a choice to follow Christ. For I read it again. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. The way of the cross, we weaponize ourselves with the power of the cross to dethrone self. Because when self is crucified, Satan has no power over you. Boom. That's it. And it's a season, a seasonal thing. Listen to the context of this thing. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered, not suffer until Christ comes, suffered. So it's a seasonal thing. He has suffered in the flesh, has ceased from sin. You're done with sin because this cross destroys the sinner in you. The blood deals with the sin. 
The crucifixion and the denial of self constitute suffering. He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So you're driven by the lust of the flesh, or you submit yourself to the will of God as the son and the daughter who are led by his spirit, not by the dictates of your flesh. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have worked the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, which is drunkenness, reveling, drunk parties and abominable idolatries, being distracted by our idols, our golden calves, our fleshly desires, wherein they, the world, think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. So the world is rioting against God, like protesting in the street. Who shall give an account to God that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Christ never said that we must go back to the laws spoken under the old covenant. In fact, he is the fulfillment of those And this is where many people stumble because they fail to understand the context of what was spoken. Jesus never meant go back and obey the laws of Moses and the things given under the old covenant. Because remember, he is a more superior covenant with new laws. And we're going to understand this, what God has meant. He's introduced a much higher standard of righteousness. We become like him. Through his transformation work in us. His birth and life was the fulfillment of that which was pre-told and prophesied. Matthew 5, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until the heaven and earth shall pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no way pass from the law until everything has been fulfilled, what was prophesied and foretold of him. He came to fulfill the law. Luke, four, Luke 24, verse 44, And Jesus said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you when I was yet with you, that all the things which were written concerning me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. That's why he, that's the context. I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. He came to fulfill the law. Then they go back to the law. He is the fulfillment of the of the old covenant through the propitiation work. He died in the place of the guilty, and the justice of God was satisfied. And we are justified in him by his blood, not by observance of the laws of the old covenant. He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Salvation only comes through the new covenant under Christ, not through the observance of the old written code. Romans 3, 19. Now then, we know that whatever the law, old covenant, it speaks to those who are under the law, the old covenant so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Because the world, the law was introduced to declare we are all sinners in need of a Savior. So when Jesus came, he fulfilled the law, the requirements of the law. He died in the place of all the sins committed under the Levitical covenant. He introduced a new order of mercy and grace and spiritual transformation and regeneration by which God destroys the sinner in us, in the way of the cross, to the minister of the spirit of life. That's the context. Therefore, by works of the law, of the old covenant, there shall no flesh be justified before him. For through the law is the knowledge of sin, The law is given to expose us as sinners in need of a Savior. But now the righteousness of God, 
that is separate from the law has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. There it is again. Even the righteousness of God that is through faith, the faith of Jesus Christ towards all and upon all who believe, not performance of legalistic rules and regulations, faith in Christ, it's a done deal, boom. We are justified by the blood, not by the observance of the laws. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but are being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Christ, through the ministry of the new covenant, declares to us a much greater weight of glory and higher standard of righteousness by which he cancels the old order of the written code of ordinances. Through the new covenant ministry of his spirit, we become living epistles which reflect his glory his nature, his likeness, his image, which is the ministry of the laws given under the old covenant, which, sorry, which the ministry of the laws given under the old covenant could not do. The law was powerless in it. It was weakened through the sinful nature, Romans 8, 12, 2 and 3, because it was weakened because of the sinful Adamic fallen nature. The power of the cross removes that nature to the death of self, in the way of the cross. That's the Melchizedek order. The ministry of death given under the old covenant had no power to remove the fallen sinful nature of man, whereas the ministry of the spirit under the new covenant does exactly that. It's two complete different covenants. Romans 8 verse 3. For what was impossible for the law of the old covenant, the laws spoken and given under the old covenant, for what was impossible for the law to do, in that it was weakened through the flesh, the sinful nature, having sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who are not walking according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's a propitiation. He died in the place of the guilty, and the divine justice of God was satisfied in Christ. And that's the other context of how he fulfilled the, the law. He died in the place of the guilty. Herein we find another aspect of the fact that Christ, through the finished work of the cross and the blood, fulfilled all the righteous requirements given under the old covenant, which is the fact that he died in the place of the guilty. God's divine justice was satisfied through the death of his son. Isaiah 53 verse 4. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we ourselves receive healing and are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray in our rebellion against God. We have turned each one to his own way. And man's kingdom must fall. Let my kingdom come and my will be done. That king must be dethroned to be brought into the order of the Melchizedek priesthood as a king and a priest. Now we serve God. We don't serve ourselves. Let his kingdom come in me and his will be done and dethrone everything in me which is not of him. And in that way I am brought through the Lamb's sacrificial ministry of obedience to Christ, the Lamb must obey the shepherd and follow him. And through that I am brought into sonship as a reigning king. That is some subjection to God. Let his kingdom come and his will be done. 
Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, His way of doing things. What God says, which is right. That's what we submit to, the laws of the new covenant spoken by Christ. Romans 5 verse 8. But God commands His own love to us because when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more, therefore, having been justified now by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him, or wrath. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His own Son, much more than having been reconciled we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now that we've been saved by grace through faith in the finished work of the cross, are we given the right by God to be, to be a lawless people? In the, con in the next scripture, we discover the power of the Melchizedek priesthood of Christ which speaks of the divine power of the ministry of the Spirit to not only save the sinner, but to also slay the sinner. So we might be brought into the glory of the life of a mature son, which have been conformed to his death, his image, and his likeness. This is the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek, new covenant, new laws, the doctrine of Christ, we conform to his standard in his life and his ministry and his example. Romans 6, what then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. We who died to sin, how shall we live any longer then? So we are called to die to sin, which is death to self. Deny ourselves, take up our cross, our cross, and we follow him in the way of the cross until he has slayed the sinner in us. God works it into us. Romans 8 verse 12 and 13. We, an we have an obligation, brothers, not against not according to the flesh, because we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if I buy the Spirit, so it's the Spirit that works in us, crucify, you put to death or mortify the works of the flesh, the old man. We shall discover the life of Christ, the new life of sonship. We are led by His Spirit in His ways, according to His standard. Conformity to his will, his new laws and new regulations given under the new covenant, Melchizedek order. A new covenant, new priesthood, new laws. The doctrine of Christ, we conform to his standard, his image and his nature and his likeness. As we grow up in him into the measure of the full stature of Christ. The doctrine of Christ. So we are called to die to sin. This unveils to us the ministry of the cross, not just unto the salvation aspect of the cross as born again babies, but it opens to us also the crucifixion process, power and administration of the cross which is wrought into those who refuse to camp on a level of salvation by the Spirit Himself. We are not called to, are we not called to overcome even to the point of the death of self and its old, faulty, sinful ways? Revelations 12. But they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb to the word of their testimony and conformity to the truth. Because no conformity to the truth, you have no testimony. If what you speak is not a reality in your life, wrought out into you by the Spirit of God until you reflect the, His image and likeness, you become the reflection of the Word, the demonstration of the Word. 
expression of his word like the Lord said to me. You are a false witness. If what you speak is not a reality in your life, you're a false witness. You're not going to give his testimony. Your testimony. The overcame him, the, the devil, through the blood of the Lamb. We embrace the ministry of the blood. We don't trample the blood of, of, of Christ, according to Hebrews 10, 28, by living willfully and rebelling against God. Because then we trample the Son of God. We insult the Spirit of grace and we... We 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 um, blaspheme the blood. Consider the blood by which we are sanctified, the unholy thing, because we willfully keep on persisting in 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 sins unto death, like drunkenness and 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 especially fornication. And how many Christians today just stay together and sleep together under a false pretense of false grace? Go and read 1 Thessalonians 4. God is the avenger of such. We are called to holiness. So they overcame him through the blood of the Lamb and through the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. This is those who lay themselves in the way of the cross. And there's a martyr aspect also of this, the grace of the martyrs, those who are martyred for Christ. We overcome through the death of self as we follow Christ in the way of the cross unto glorified sonship, which is the upward call of God for those who want to receive the honor and the reward of the overcomer. Romans 6, 5 to 7, For if we have, if we have been united together in the likeness of his death in the way of the cross, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. First death, then resurrection into glorified life. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. And we are stripped of that in the way of the cross, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Like, like he says in First Peter 4, those who have died have been freed from sin. Those who have suffered in the flesh in the way of the cross by allowing God to strip them of themselves, is done with sin, because God has destroyed the sinner in them. For he who has died has been freed from sin, because if self, the flesh, is dead, Satan has no hold on you. There's a place in God where Satan cannot come. And I was taken in there. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, I was taken there. I sat in the seat of the overcomer next to Jesus Christ. And the Lord showed me the reality of this. There's a place in God where Satan cannot come. It's Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God. That's sonship. That's the Holy of Holies. That's mountaintop rulership. There's a functioning heir. In context with Isaiah 57, this is what the Aina Lofty One says, I live and dwell in a high and a holy place, but with him that is of a broken spirit and a humble heart, those who humble in themselves in his presence, because God resists the proud, those who are wise in their own eyes. And he gives grace to those who humble themselves before him, to be stripped of him, so that we can take up the life of Christ, to be brought into the order of Christ. We are called to die to self. Philippians 3 verse 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings in the way of the cross, being conformed to his death in the way of the cross. First death, then resurrection into glorified sonship. I remember over 20 years ago when the Lord called me into the way of the cross after I was born again like four and a half years. It was a powerful encounter with Satan and Jesus that night. But the Lord said to me, for the joy that was set before me, I endured the cross. You are sharing in my sufferings to share in my glory. Self must die because the glory of Christ and the life of Christ is not revealed in self and the flesh, the old man. The flesh must be crucified. Then that new creation butterfly in us is brought forth. The worm must die 
flesh, the earth crawling worm, whose mind is on earthly things. That we may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I have already received or have already been perfected, but I am striving so that I may also lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ. Brethren, I do not count myself as having attained, but there's one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind, because it's a journey to discipline, Hebrews 12, into the mountain of God, and reaching forth to the things that are ahead. I press toward the goal for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus' sonship. We have been called not just unto salvation, but to press on to know the Lord, to make our calling and election sure, because the ministry of the Spirit through the power of the new covenant conforms the faithful seeker to His likeness and image. Not to tablets written on a stone, tablets on human hearts. He changes us to become like the truth. We reflect the word Himself, Christ. The doctrine of Christ, we become like Him. Expressions of the word that naturally walks in obedience before God. Those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. It's as we follow Christ in the way of the cross, in obedience unto the death of self, that we are stripped of our former self in sinful ways as sheep being led to the slaughter. In this painful journey of crucifixion, and where we face the depravity of our own sinful brokenness, weaknesses, faults, failures, and imperfections. We are declared by Him more than conquerors because He will see us through by the power of His love, through the ministry and operation of His Spirit that works this into us. It's not the law of performance written on tablets of stone. It's graceful inward transformation by the ministry of the Spirit. But God says in Ezekiel 36 from verse 23, I will remove the heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will give you a new heart with right desires. I will put my spirit in you and I will cause you to follow my ordinances and my precepts and my, desi and my desires. Led by His spirit. And that's the order of the new covenant, new laws, doctrine of Christ. We become like Him through inward transformation. That's the context of this thing. The following scripture declares these facts, our journey in the way of the cross. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those, the good, the bad, and the ugly, who love God, to those who are called according to His purposes, because those whom He did for new, He pre also predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son, Conformity to sonship, the doctrine of Christ under the new covenant, new laws, conform to His image. That He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now whom He predestinated, these He also called. And whom He called, these He also justified. And whom He justified, these He also glorified. We go to glorification, to the death of self. In the way of the cross, that's the context. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Because God knows in the way of the cross, we're going to face our demons. And our own inward brokenness and pain and anger and resentment and bitterness. His cross saved you from sin. Your cross delivers you from sin. His cross forgave your past. Your cross must heal your past. Because God in the way of your cross, if you follow Him in the way of the cross and obedience to Christ, destroys and confronts and dethrones everything in us. Every kingdom in us must fall that he, His kingdom can come. 
His will be done in us. So then God encourages us in the way of the cross. Who shall bring an accusation against the elect of God? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one that condemns? It is Christ who died, but rather who has raised again, who is even now at the right hand of God, who is also making intercession for us. So in other words, his intercession ministry through the mercy seat of Christ administers this Melchizedek order. Our new high priest, a merciful high priest. What shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And I can add you what the Lord said, your faults, your failures, your weaknesses, your imperfections. Nothing shall separate us. We see that as an outcry for God to intervene in our behalf. The Lord said to me, because we're like fish on dry ground without the operation of His Spirit, the Spirit of life under the new covenant, the ministry of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3. It brings life, not death. God doesn't condemn you. He brings life. He turns your weaknesses into strength, your failures into success, your shortcomings into perfection. He perfects us. He's the part that we the clay. He does the transformation work. It's not a ministry of performance. It's a ministry of graceful transformation. The same spirit of grace that saves you must now simply be allowed to change you. Accordingly, it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are reckoned as sheep for the slaughter. This is the priestly ministry of Christ, the Lamb ministry. We're going to learn more about this. First, we are perfected as lambs. You can't roar like a lion if you don't first learn to bleat like a humble lamb. You must humble yourselves before him that he can exalt you and lift you up. We're not goats. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Through all of our sins, failures, shortcomings, weaknesses, and perfections, and the struggle in this being stripped in the way of the cross, God says, you are more than conqueror, my child. Look up and focus on me. Isaiah 26 verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace, Lord, his mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you to work the change, the healing, the deliverance that we need, the victory, the freedom, the transformation. Look to him. Not the law of performance written on tablets of stone. It's graceful inward transformation wrought into us by the Spirit of God. It's what He works into us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, or things present, or things to come, nor height, nor depth. And this is powerful. This, this coincides with Isaiah 51. Consider the pit out of which you were dug. Neither depth, because God literally rescues us from the depths of the influences of hell. No height. This is the highest rank of principality. The influence against we struggle, Ephesians 6. We struggle not against flesh and blood. Neither height nor depth. So he delivers us from the depths of hell even to the highest of the second heaven influence. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So lift up your head, pilgrim of the cross, and focus on Christ, because you're on your way to victory, not defeat. The next scripture confirms all of the above, the Melchizedek order. Ministry of the Spirit of Transformation. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we, as some others, 
need letters of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you. You are our letter written in our hearts. This is beautiful. We become living epistles. God changes us by the truth. He works the standard of Christ-likeness into us, living epistles that reflect His image and likeness. The Word becomes flesh in us. We become the voice and operation and the expression and the authority of the Word of God Himself. Hebrews 4.12, He cuts the sun between spirit, soul, joints, and marrow. The Lord said, I want to weave myself into the fibers of your being, into oneness with me. We become one with Him. You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read of all men. We become expressions of Christ. This is the context of Hebrews 10. The new covenant, the Holy Spirit gives testimony. I will write my laws in their hearts and in their minds. This is the new covenant. It's not the old order, the old written code that produces death. The context is, the Lord said to me, what I mean there is I will change you. By my truth, my standard of what I say to become like Jesus, the word of God himself. Divine expressions of Christ. We take on his nature. We become like him. The doctrine of Christ. The new laws under a new covenant, under a new priesthood. That's the context. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the letter of Christ ministered by us written not with ink but with the spirit of the living God. I will write my laws in the hearts and in minds. You become the letter of Christ. You reflect him. God does that change. I will write my laws in their hearts and in their minds. This must be clearly understood. Not in tablets of stone, the old laws under the old covenant. Not in tablets of stone, but in fleshly tablets of the heart. We become the habitation of the word. And such trust we have through Christ to God would not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of as of ourselves but our sufficiency is of god because he works the change in us the glory belongs to him we are his workmanship who also has made us able ministers of the new covenant not of the letter of the old covenant but of the spirit of transformation inwardly to become like Christ, an epistle of Christ, reflecting him, his nature, his likeness, his image. For the old code, the letter kills. It was the ministry of death. It's an old covenant. But the Spirit gives life, the new covenant ministry. But if the ministry of death written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance which glory was to be done away how shall not the ministration of the spirit the new covenant be rather glorious or much more glorious accelerating in glory because we come like the word himself the letters of Christ living epistles reflecting him Written by God. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, because this is a ministration of grace, the new covenant, much more does the ministry of righteousness succeed in glory. For even that which was made glory has had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory which excels, accelerate the glory. For if that which is done away was glorious, the old covenant, it's done away, it's a done deal, it's old. Much more that which remains in glory, the new covenant. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses which put a veil 
over his face. This is why when people turn to the old covenant, they are veiled from the glory of the new covenant because they seek to be justified by the law. That's why God said to me, they're committing spiritual suicide because they crucify my son all over again. The old covenant is done away with. Colossians 2, it was nailed to the cross with Christ. That's the whole context of the book of Romans and the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews. Their minds were blinded for until this day remains the same veil not taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, which veil is done away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, the veil is on their hearts. So when you turn to be justified by the old laws and the old covenant, you are veiled from seeing the reality of the new covenant, the glory of the new covenant by which we become like Christ. Sonship. Nevertheless, when it shall, when it shall turn to the Lord, if anyone shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord, and God will open your eyes to see. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Not performance, liberty. He sets us free from the law of sin and death. But we all, with unveiled face, behold, as in the glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. This is intimate relationship as we spend time in his presence daily. Because it's within his presence where transformation takes place from glory to glory. He's the potter, we are the clay. Father said, you need change. I will work that change into you by you being touched by the power of my love. It's what God works into you. He changes you. He does the changing. We become a letter, a letter, a living epistle that reflects Christ. A living epistle looks like Jesus. A living epistle looks like Jesus, talks like Jesus, has taken on the divine nature and holiness of Jesus, and does like Jesus. Even the greater works which he declared in John 14, verse 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, he that does believe on me, we become like him, we follow him. Believe what he says, be conformed to his words, like he says in, in John 14, if you love me, obey me, and my father will love that person who will come and make a habitation with him. We become the habitation of God by his spirit. That's the order of the Melchizedek priesthood. He that believes on me, the works that I do, he shall also do, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Against such there is no law. Remember that the born-again baby seed has been called unto the fruitfulness of Christ-likeness. Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit, which is Christ-likeness, the life of Christ has been wrought out and fully developed in the life journey and the growth process of the born-again seed. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. That's the order of the Melchizedek priesthood and the way of the cross in obedience unto the death of self. I read to you a prophecy given by J. Leland Earls over 40 years ago. He was a kingdom forerunner that confirms this teaching. The Spirit of God speaks. You shall note that it was the lion of the tribe of Judah who prevailed to open the seven sealed book. Remember, not after the order of Aaron, like he says in Hebrews 7, 
of which Moses said nothing, because Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. You shall note that it was the line of the tribe of Judah who prevailed to open the seven sealed book. Yet it was a lamb who took the book or scroll from the hand of him that sat on the throne and opened the seals thereof. What does this portray? It portrays the truth of Jesus' ministry as king and priest. This is the order of Melchizedek, kings and priests. A priest, he is the Lamb of God who gave himself as the perfect sacrifice on the cross and whoever lives to make intercession for the redeemed. That's Hebrews 7, verse 25 to 27. As a king, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah who reigns on the throne of David. Isaiah 9, verse 6 to 7. Luke 1, verse 31 to 33. Now, during this dispensation of redemption, his lamb ministry predominates. That is why he's seen as a lamb. Revelations 5 or 6. But as the present dispensation draws to a close, the seals of judgment are open to bring to an end the misrule of man. And it is the lion ministry that begins to prevail. For Jesus the King begins to actively take over that which is rightfully his. And this shall be understood within the man-child company of the sixth day. Because God said to me, Adam was created on the sixth day. We are again in the sixth day of prophecy. A thousand years is like a day to God and a day is like a thousand years. There was two thousand years or two prophetic days between Adam and Abraham. Abraham and Christ and Christ and now. It's the sixth day. Now the man-child must stand up in governmental authority. This is the context of God is saying here. But as this dispensation draws to a close and the seals of judgment are open to bring to an end the misrule of man because we, we introduce the kingdom order of Christ. So as the present dispensation draws to a close and the seals of judgment are open to bring to an end the misrule of man, it is the lion ministry. Because we introduce the kingdom age now, the seventh day, the thousand year millennial day of the Lord that begins to prevail. For Jesus the king begins to actively take over that which is rightfully his. In other words, he's not coming to choose sides, he's coming to take over. That's Daniel 2. The stone that comes to thresh and crush all other kingdoms, opposing kingdoms. We come to take over. Like God said to me, you are the coming kingdom. Christ begins to exert the power and authority which was given to him after his resurrection. Matthew 18, 18. Of Matthew 28, 18. In such a way as to completely eliminate the usurpation of Satan-controlled man and exercise his own right as king. This is Satan's Babylonian empire that shall be crushed to pieces like the threshing of a summer, on a summer floor. It will be crushed to powder. It is during the end time period of the seals and the judgments that forces of judgment are set in motion so that, so that man's civilization will utterly collapse. Because remember Hebrews 12, we belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And we, God showed me a vision of Hebrews 12 shaking and Agai 2 shaking. I was taken into the realm of the spirit through the veil and God showed me that shaking of tribulation that's coming. This, this kingdom comes to shake everything. Once more I will shake. And that's what causes tribulation. And in the midst of the shaking, it raises up a glorious church. That's the context of prophecy. And that's finally it becomes fulfilled that the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign for the eons. Revelation 11.15 I remember an assignment years ago in 
Zimbabwe. I believe it was Bulawayo. There's a place called World's View. Very high, like in a cliff. It's so high you see the clouds. You can jump down there with an hang glider or a parachute. And I stood there and there was this flat rock, like a table, huge flat rock. And I went in, up to the stairs into like a watchman guard. It was a very prophetic thing. And the father said to me, take a stone and go and engrave on that stone, Revelations 11, 15, the, at the place called World's View. The kingdoms of this world has become the kingdoms of our God. Because father said to me, I'm taking creation back through my sons. This is part of the greater works of John 14, 12. The lion nature of Jesus' ruling authority must be made manifest, and this begins to prevail as the seals are opened, but it does not completely predominate until all rival rule and authority has been put down. First, his Lamb ministry of redemption must be completely fulfilled in a repented, crucified people for the present age as they subject themselves to God. Otherwise, Satan's legal right to control creation remains. And this is the order of the kingdom age now coming to dethrone this prince of the power of the air. I saw that revelation to our battle when God took me through the veil when I was praying and fasting years ago. I saw the judgment on Satan's principalities according to Romans of Revelation 12 with our cast out. And the Lord said to me seven years ago in context of Isaiah 60 to 62, Arise, shine, your light has come in the midst of great darkness and you shall be like a royal diadem in the hand of the Lord. That's rulership, that's manifested glorification of sonship. And the Lord said, it's time to possess the heavens. Arise, shine, arise, resurrection. Into that's, re, re, Isaiah 60 to 62 speaks of the revelation of the sons of God, the glorified bride. They are brought into the order of Christ. Like he says in Isaiah 62, and I will not rest until I cause the righteousness of Zion to go forth like a blazing torch. That's not the propitiation gift of righteousness. We become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. No, that is the order of sonship wrought into us in the way into Zion through the discipline of the father of Hebrews 12. While we undergo discipline, it's painful, but later on it produces the peaceful fruits of righteousness for those who've been disciplined and trained by it. I will not rest until I cause the righteousness of Zion to go forth like a blazing torch. We reflect the glory of Christ. Arise, shine, the glory of the Lord rises upon you, shall be seen upon you. That's the order of the Melchizedek priesthood under the new covenant. Kings and priests, reigning kings under Christ and serving priests under Christ. This, my people, says the Spirit of the living God, must also be the pattern in your own lives. First, you must, be, you must fulfill the pattern of the Lamb. You must learn submission, meekness, sacrifice and willingness to hear and follow the voice of the shepherd. That's John 10, 27. Or you will never enter the lion ministry of joint rulership with Christ. If you are fully yielded and prepared as a lamb, first bleed like a lamb, then we roar like a reigning lion. If you are fully yielded and prepared as a lamb, then you shall come forth in that entire ministry of power, boldness, and authority, which is symbolized by the lion. The fact that the lion of the tribe of Judah has begun to exercise his prerogatives will be manifested on the earth 
not only by judgments upon man's civilization, but also by the bringing forth of a people who shall enter into spiritual realms of ruling with Christ that no people have ever experienced before and which shall cause a spiritual shaking and a revival unprecedented in human history. Great shall be the glory, power and dominion which shall be shown forth by a people who have first come into the fullness of the Lamb nature of full submission and then are moved into the line ministry of the Lord's end time glorious church. The preceding is portrayed in a vision which John saw of the mighty messenger with a little book. The mighty messenger who is preparing an end time body through the unveiling of the end time message of the little book is seen crying with a loud voice as when a lion roars. Manifested sons, the coming kingdom. Revelation 10 verse 3. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Here is portrayed a people responding to the vibratory pitch of the lion of the tribe of Zura. Like Father said to me, the sons of thunder. And entering into the lion ministry of the seven thunders. Sons of thunder. No longer meek and lamb like before the world, but bold as a lion and with kingly power and authority. Yet the lion and the lamb must lie together, together in every member of that body. See Isaiah 11 verse 6. For unto the Lord himself they shall be ever lamb-like, submissive, obedient, hearing only his voice. But unto the world they shall manifest the lion-like nature of kingly authority, ruling power, regal bearing, and a word ministry of spiritual vitality and liberating dynamic. But this shall come forth only in a people thoroughly prepared by the Lord and who have learned to live and walk in the Spirit giving themselves in totality to the call of the Spirit upon their lives. I bless you with this message in the name of Yeshua, Jesus.